Hi everyone, welcome to the Chapter 15, Part 2 Review. We're going to be talking about the Age of Reform from 1790 to 1860. This is the Age of Reform that's typically called the Jacksonian Reform Movements. The Reformers were intelligent, inspired idealists touched by evangelical religion who dreamed of freeing the world from its earthly evils. Women were very prominent in reform, especially for suffrage. The reform provided opportunity to escape the home and to enter the public arena. The imprisonment for debt continued to be a very big problem. Criminal codes in states were softened during this time period. A number of capital offenses were reduced, brutal punishments were slowly eliminated, and the idea that prisons should reform as well as punish, hence called reformatories or houses of correction, and penitentiaries, which meant for penance. The insane were still treated with cruelty and many were chained in jails or poorhouses. Dorothea Dix was a reformer who possessed infinite compassion and willpower and traveled 60,000 miles in eight years to document firsthand and observe uh, the difficulties of insanity and having people in asylums. This is a picture, a portrait of Dorothea Dix. Basically, she was a believer that idleness was a scourge, and she prescribed rigorous exercise regimens for prisoners. Um, basically, one of the examples of this were having uh, prisoners chained and having to turn a wheel for long periods of time. The stepping mill and the wheel is actually shown here in this picture of Auburn Prison from New York, 1823. Her classic petition in 1843 to the Massachusetts legislature described her visits. Her persistent prodding resulted in improved conditions. There was also agitation for peace. The American Peace Society in 1828 was formed with ringing declarations of war on war. They made progress by mid-century but suffered a setback with the Crimean War in Europe and the Civil War in America. The ever-present problems of alcohol attracted dedicated reformers. Specifically, the American Temperance Society was formed in Boston in 1826. It implored drinkers to sign a temperance pledge, organized children's clubs that were called the Cold Water Army, and they used pictures, pamphlets, and lurid lectures to convey their message. This was a picture of signing the pledge, um, which was a lithograph, in 1846, showing temperance reformers decrying the many evils of alcohol but basically trying to get former drinkers to pledge to abstain. Most popular tract was T.S. Arthur's Ten Nights in a Barroom and What I Saw There, written in 1854. The early foes of the demon drink adopted two lines of attack. They wanted to stiffen the individual's will to resist alcohol, temperance rather than teetotalism or total elimination. And they also wanted to eliminate intoxicants, intoxicants by legislation. Neil S. Dow, the father of prohibition, sponsored the main law of prohibition in 1851. The main law of 1851 banned the manufacture and sale of intoxicating liquor. Other states followed Maine's example. And by 1857, a dozen states passed prohibition laws. Clearly, uh, this was impossible to legislate the thirst for alcohol out of existence, and on the eve of the Civil War, prohibitionists had registered inspiriting gains, though, so their reform movement was actually, um, did make some progress. There was much less drinking among women. Women in America in the 1800s were regarded as perpetual minors, not able to vote or own property, and could be beaten by their husbands. Some now avoided marriage, and 10% of adult women remained spinsters by the Civil War. The gender differences strong, were strongly emphasized in the 1800s. The burgeoning market economy separated women and men into distinct economic roles. The home was the woman's special sphere, which was the centerpiece of the cult of domesticity. Clamorous female reformers demanded rights for women and campaigned for temperance, and the abolition of slavery. Like men, they were touched by the evangelical spirit of the Second Great Awakening. The women's rights movement was mothered by Lucretia Mott, who was a Quaker, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who insisted on leaving the word obey out of her marriage ceremony and advocated suffrage for women. Quaker raised Susan B. Anthony was also a militant lecturer for women's rights. This is a picture of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony 
two of the suffragists battling for the women's rights to vote. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell is the first female graduate of a medical college. The talented Grimke sisters, Sarah and Angelina, championed anti-slavery. Lucy Stone remained, uh, retained her maiden name after marriage, hence the latter-day Lucy Stoners. And Amelia Bloomer revolted against the current street-sweeping female attire by donning a short skirt with, a Turkish, with Turkish trousers, which was eventually called Bloomers. This is an anti-feminist anti cartoon showing the men in this cartoon sewing, tending the baby, and washing clothes, making the scene, the scene feel or seem very absurd. This is a picture of the bloomers that Amelia Bloomer helped bring into existence. At the Women's Rights Convention at Seneca Falls, which took place in New York in 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton read a Declaration of Sentiments. In the spirit of the Declaration of Independence, all men and women are created equal. One resolution formally demanded a ballot for women. And the Seneca Falls meeting launched the modern women's rights movement. This was a crusade for women's rights, but was but actually as a result of the campaign against slavery, the crusade for women's rights was eclipsed. While any white male over the age of 21 could vote, no woman could, yet women were being admitted to colleges. Some states, like Mississippi in 1839, permitted wives to own property even after marriage. Utopias were created during this time period as well, and 40 communities of cooperative, communistic, and communitarian nature were set up in these utopia movements. Robert Owen founded a communal society of a 1,000 people in 1825 at New Harmony, Indiana. Brook Farm, which was in Massachusetts, started in 1841 with about 20 intellectuals committed to transcendentalism. This was destroyed by fire. An adventure in plain living and high thinking actually collapsed in debt and was not viable. The Oneida community in 1848 was founded in New York. They practiced free love, birth control, and a eugenic selection of parents to produce superior offspring. They flourished for 30 years, largely because its artisans made superior steel traps and silver plates. The Oneida community is responsible for the Oneida silverware that we see today. The Shakers are the longest lived sect founded in England, but brought to America by Mother Ann Lee in 1774. They attained membership of 6,000 by 1840, but since their customs prohibited marriage and sexual relations, they were virtually extinct by 1940. This was the dawn of scientific achievement also, and the scientific talent of the time um, included Professor Benjamin Stillman, who was the most influential American scientist. He was a pioneer chemist and geologist who taught at Yale College for 50 years. Another was Professor Louis Agassiz. Agassiz, sorry. They served for a quarter of a century at Harvard College, and they were uh, he was a path-breaking biologist who insisted on original research and deplored the reigning overemphasis on memory work. This is a picture of the Shaker's emphasis on communal work and separation of the sexes captured in this painting of the Bishop Hill Colony in Illinois. This is a picture of John Audubon, who was a naturalist and gifted artist who drew the birds of America in loving detail. This is also another picture uh, by John Audubon. Professor Asa Gray, 1810 to 1888 of Harvard College, published over 350 books, monographs, and papers. His books set new standards for clarity and interest. Another, uh, the naturalist that we just saw in the past two pictures, John Audubon, painted waterfowl in their natural habitat and magnificently illustrated a book called Birds of America. The Audubon Society for Protection of Birds was later named in his honor. Medicine in America during this time period was very primitive by modern standards. People everywhere complained of ill health, self-prescribed patient um, Patent medicines were very common. 
fad diets were popular. The use of medicine by doctors was also um, often harmful. Victims of surgical operations were actually tied down during this time period, and some medical progress was made by the 1840s with the addition of anesthetics. Uh, this is Mansion House, which is the center of the Oneidas community life during the mid-19th century. This is also another picture of Mansion House. Flush with political interdependence, Americans strain to achieve cultural autonomy and create a national art worthy of aspirations. So, in architecture, Americans copied old world styles rather than creating indigenous new ones. The federal style was one of these styles, and it was borrowed from the classical Greek and Roman examples and emphasized symmetry, balance, and restraint. Public buildings incorporated neoclassical columns, domes, and pediments, and a lot of these can be seen in our national monuments. Charles, Charles Bullfinch's design of the Massachusetts State House is a prime example. Benjamin Latrobe's additions to the U.S. Capitol and the President's House, which is now called the White House, also showcase neoclassicalism. Greek Revival was also predominant during this time period between 1820 and 1850. By mid-century, medieval Gothic forms with emphasis on arches, sloped roofs, and large stained glass windows. The Palladian style was also predominant during this time period. Thomas Jefferson's Virginia home, Monticello, is a perfect example. The modeled, uh, the new capital in Richmond was modeled on ancient Roman temples as well, and Jefferson's University of Virginia is the finest example of neoclassicalism. This is difficult to, to create a distinctive style of painting during this time period. Americans prior to this time period had um, exported artists and imported art. And basically, there was a Puritan prejudice that art was a sinful waste of time. This is a picture of the Virginia State Capitol, which we discussed in the neoclassical style. American painters during this time period begin to emerge. Gilbert Stuart produces several portraits of Washington. Charles Wilson Peale painted some 60 portraits of Washington, and John Trumbull recaptured the revolution's hero heroic scenes and the spirit on the scores of striking canvases. So these painters primarily painted about things that happened during the American Re Revolutionary period with a sense of patriotism. After the War of 1812, painters turned from human portraits and history paintings to pastoral mirrorings of local landscapes. At the Hudson River School in the 1820s and 1830s, Thomas Cole and Asher Durand celebrated raw sublimity and grand divinity of nature. Cole's The Oxbow in 1836 portrayed ecological threats to human encroachment on once, once pristine environments. And the masterpiece, The Course of Empire, depicted a cyclical rise and fall of human civilization, which was an analogy of industrialization and expansion. The Oxbow by Thomas Cole in 1836 can be seen below. Music slowly shed restraints of colonial days when Puritans frowned upon non-religious singing. Rhythmic and nostalgic darky tunes became popular. American minstrel shows were very unique during this time period. Dixie uh, became popular, in, especially in the South, and would become the Confederates' battle hymn in 1859. Stephen Foster, 1826 to 1864, is most famous for Southern songs like Camptown Races, Old Folks at Home, and Oh Susanna. They were busy, uh, while they were busy conquering the continent, Americans poured creative efforts into practical outlets. There were political essays that were written, um, for example, The Federalists and The Anti-Federalists, The Federalists written by John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison. Pamphlets like Thomas Paine's Common Sense were written in 1776. There were political orations, masterpieces of Daniel Webster, and Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, published in 1818. So a national literature began to bloom. Romanticism also played a role. 
And this was a reaction against the hyper-reactional, hyper-rational enlightenment. It originated in revolutionary Europe and in England, but emphasized imagination over reason, nature over civilization, intuition over calculation, and self over society. It celebrated human potential and prized heroic genius of the individual artists. American artists during this time period, like Washington Irving, who was the first to win international recognition as a literary figure, and James Fenimore Cooper, who gained the world fame by making New World themes respectable. These two men were very popular as some of the first American literary artists. William Cullen Bryant as also wrote poetry and set a model for journalism that was dignified, liberal, and conscientious. This is a portrait of Washington Irving and his literary friends at Sunnyside in 1864. Transcendentalism emerged as a result of this movement, and it resulted from liberalizing of straight-laced Puritan theology. It rejected the prevailing empiricist theory of John Locke that all knowledge comes through the senses. Truth rather transcends senses. It cannot be found by observation alone. And every person possesses an inner light that can illuminate the highest truth and indirectly touch God. Those are the beliefs of the transcendentalists. The beliefs of transcendentalism was that the individualists um, in matters of religion and society was most important. They were committed to self-reliance, self-culture, and self-discipline. They were hostile to authority, formal institutions, and conventional wisdom, and there was a romantic exaltation of dignity of the individual, whether black or white, main, which was the mainspring of the numerous humanitarian reforms. The best-known transcendentalist was Ralph Waldo Emerson. The most thrilling effort was The American Scholar, which was delivered at Harvard College, in 1837, it was an intellectual declaration of independence that urged American writers to throw off European traditions and delve into cultural rich the cultural riches surrounding them. It stressed self-reliance, self-improvement, self-confidence, optimism, and freedom. Henry David Thoreau was another transcendentalist who condemned a government that supported slavery and refused to pay his Massachusetts poll tax. He wrote Walden, or Life in the Woods, in 1854, which chronicled his two-year life on the edges of Walden Pond and epitomized the romantic quest for isolation from society's corruptions. He also wrote an essay called On the Duty of Civil Disobedience in 1849, which influenced Gandhi to resist British rule in India and also influenced Martin Luther King's ideas about nonviolence. Margaret Fuller edited the Movement's Journal, which was called The Dial. Her series of conservations provoked scholarly dialogue among the local elite women. Women in the 19th Century, written in 1845, was a powerful critique of gender roles and an iconic statement of the budding feminist movement. Walt Whitman was another writer during this time period. He's famous for the collection of poems, Leaves of Grass, which was highly emotional and unconventional. He dispensed with titles, stanzas, rhymes, and at times regular meter. He located the divinity in commonplace natural objects such and as well as the human body, and he was informally called the Poet Laureate of Democracy for his praise of the common people. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was one of the most popular poets produced in America. Some of his most admired poems, Evangeline, The Song of Hiawatha, the courtship of Miles Standish were all based on American themes. He was the first American to be enshrined in the poet's corner of Westminster Abbey. John Greenleaf Whittier was the uncrowned poet laureate of the anti-slavery crusade. He was vastly important in influencing social actions and helped arouse a callous America to slavery issues. James Russell Lowell ranks as one of the uh, one of America's best poets and was a distinguished essayist literary critic, diplomat, and editor. He is remembered as a political satirist in his Bigelow Papers, which were published in 1846 to 1858. Louisa M. A. Alcott, a transcendentalist who wrote Little Women in 1868. Emily Dickinson, who lived as a recluse, was an extreme example of, romantics, of a romantic artist's desire for social remove. 
In spare language and simple rhymes, she explored universal themes of nature, love, death, and immortality. She was, hesitated, she was uh, hesitant to publish her poems, but after her death, nearly 2,000 were found and published. This is a picture of a lithograph of Louisa May Alcott. William Gilmore Stewart was the mo most noteworthy literary figure produced by the South. He wrote 82 books, winning the title The Cooper of the South. Favorite themes were captured in titles like The Yamasee, The Cacique of Kiowa, and these dealt with the South during the Revolutionary War. The national and international reputation suffered as a result of his overt pro-slavery and secessionist sentiments. Not all writers believed in human goodness and social progress. Edgar Allan Poe was a gifted poet who wrote in mesmerizing rhythms, especially in the well-known Raven. He excelled in short stories, especially Gothic horror types. He was fascinated by ghostly and ghastly, as in the fall of the House of Usher. Two writers reflected continuing Calvinists' obsessions with original sin and with never-ending struggle between good and evil. Nathaniel Hawthorne was one of these. In his masterpiece, The Scarlet Letter, he described the Puritan practice of forcing adulteresses to wear a scarlet A on her clothing. In The Marble Fawn, he explored the omnipresence of evil. Herman Melville was another who wrote the masterpiece Moby Dick, which was a complex allegory of good and evil. He had to wait until the 20th century for readers and for proper recognition. This is a painting of capturing a sperm whale, which um, basically vividly portrays the idea of Melville's Moby Dick. American historians like George Bancroft deservedly received the title Father of, the American, of American History. He published superior patriotic histories of the United States based on vast research. And William H. Prescott also published a classic account of conquest of Mexico and of Peru. Francis Parkman penned a brilliant series of volumes beginning in 1851 and chronicled the struggle between France and Britain in colonial times for mastery of North America. Most early historians of the 1800s were from New England because they had libraries and there was already an established literary tradition. They tended to be negative um, whenever they wrote about the South. This is the chronology from the chapter, and we'll do more about these different reform movements as we discuss them and work in class.